Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest uh, podcast. And this is going to be on gastric causes of abdominal pain. And this is based on an exhibit that uh, Chris Fung and I did from uh, Rankin Ray this past year. It's also an article that's coming out in emergency radiology, so you can look for it there. And Chris Fung was a terrific fellow, and he's now up in Alberta, Canada. So we'll give him a shout out in Alberta. So we often speak about the stomach, and often when we do speak about it, we speak about malignancies and the ability to detect early cancers, the differential diagnosis between adenocarcinoma and lymphoma and perhaps just tumors. But in this exhibit or in this talk, what we're going to look at is some of the uh, role that the stomach plays in the evaluation of the acute abdomen, uh, look at a range of different pathologies that you might see in practice. Also, we'll focus on some of the importance of doing the correct technique in all cases when looking at the stomach. Now, in this um, article, we actually looked at the stomach thinking about things in two different categories, making things intrinsic pathology to the stomach, which means arising from the gastric wall, or extrinsic, which are processes outside the stomach but involving the stomach secondarily. And probably the most common uh, thing that involves the stomach secondarily would be pancreatitis. When you think about intrinsic, you go anywhere from gastritis to ulcers to pneumatosis to intussusception. Uh, and when you think about extrinsic, you go from trauma to fistulae to hemorrhage and foreign bodies as some examples. Now, as with all of CT, technique is everything. The biggest source of errors, both overcalling and undercalling gastric pathology, is lack of good gastric distension. And whether you use positive contrast or water or air, you need to have good gastric distension. And it's our process in our practice that every patient gets three cups of oral contrast, whatever the contrast may be to distend the stomach, the last cup when the patient gets on the table, this will guarantee that the stomach is well distended. Uh, in terms of techniques, when to use positive, when to use neutral contrast, positive surely is the best if you're looking for fistulas or the site of perforation. A neutral contrast or negative contrast is best when you're looking for small ulcerations and also for looking for small tumors. Just a uh, couple comments about anatomy, classic things we always think about from fundus to body to greater curvature and lesser curvature. It's always interesting to me that you have to think for a second what's the greater curvature and what's lesser curvature when you look at the axial imaging. Though when you look at the coronal views, it's obviously a whole lot more uh, obvious. And then you can see also the pylorus uh, on those images. So let's look at a few cases. And if you look at this first case, um, there's no doubt there's marked gastric pathology, particularly in the body of the stomach and in the antrum. There's diffuse wall thickening. It's low density. Could this be carcinoma? I guess it could be just because you have wall thickening. But usually with carcinoma or lymphoma or any other tumor, it's going to be more solid in attenuation. This is low density, which makes me think about the possibility of edema, which would tend to focus me on inflammatory disease. This patient would end up getting endoscopy in clinical practice. Um, this was a cause of gastric wall thickening due to infectious gastritis. Again, the key findings, focal or diffuse wall thickening, which in this case was diffuse. There's some adjacent fat stranding, which is not uncommon. You don't need a perforation to see gastric stranding. And sometimes you will see on arterial phase imaging a halo appearance, though that's fairly uncommon. We mentioned before that there is overlap between inflammatory disease and neoplastic disease, and endoscopy is usually going to be the uh, thing that makes the decision. When we talk about differentiating carcinoma versus inflammation, over one centimeter wall thickness, we tend to think about carcinoma. More solid appearance of the gastric wall, we tend to think about uh, carcinoma. When there's edema or low density, we're thinking about gastritis. And again, in terms of management, endoscopy uh, becomes very critical to exclude neoplasm and look for H. pylori infection. And this is just a very nice example of that. Okay, another case. You look at this example, there's some food in the stomach, but you see there's 
wall thickening, particularly on the region of the greater curvature. Uh, when you look, this enhancement at that point as well. And what you're looking at actually is a gastric ulcer, which did not perforate. You can particularly see the um, area of focal thickening and ulcer on the uh, sagittal view. Again, there's some mucosal enhancement present. I do think it's a challenge to distinguishing 100% an ulcer that is benign versus a neoplastic process. Obviously, when it's more bulky or there's nodes, I'm thinking neoplasm, but this is a good case where it could be a challenge. Uh, you see focal wall thickening, minimal adjacent fat stranding. You can see the ulcer crater in this case. Uh, patients will typically, again, get endoscopy, particularly if we're suspicious at all, this could be a neoplasm. Uh, clinical management in terms of these patients would be to exclude a neoplasm, excess for H. pylori infection, and typically these patients will be put on uh, a drug therapy with proton pump inhibitors. Okay, another case. Patient has acute abdominal pain, but what you see in this case compared to the prior case is that the patient has a large pneumoperitoneum. When you see a pneumoperitoneum, it means there's a perforation present, assuming the patient has it in a recent surgery or a G2 placement. And you can see in this case, there's diffuse gastric wall thickening, this fluid around the stomach between stomach and pancreas, and this free air present. If you look very carefully at this case, and you can see uh, where the arrows are, you can see that the patient has a large ulcer present, there's adjacent fat stranding. Uh, in endoscopy, you will see the focal thickening. You may see the ulceration, but you may not recognize the perforation. Um, perforation of a gastric ulcer, be it benign or malignant, uh, requires surgical management. So this is the type of patient who will be going to surgery. You can see in this case the perforated ulcer arising from the antrum. There's gastric content extending into the lesser sac, which explains the fluid between the stomach and the pancreas, as well as explaining the patient's pneumoperitoneum. This is a great example of a surgical emergency. Routine ulcers are not, but once we're talking about pneumoperitoneum, we're going to surgery. Okay, another case. Patient with acute nausea, and you look at this case and you kind of say to yourself, what's going on here? Where exactly is the stomach? Where exactly is the esophagus? And is there a twist in place present? And you can see in this case, the location of the duodenum versus the esophagus. And what you recognize is this patient has a volvulus, which is rotation around the gastric long axis in this patient. The clinical presentation is usually abrupt. Sudden epigastric pain, intractable retching, and the inability to pass an NG tube. Uh, the organoaxial uh, type of uh, volvulus is more common. CT findings are kind of tricky at times because at times you simply blow by the study, perhaps thinking you're simply dealing with a large hiatal hernia. But what you notice is there's reversal of the greater and lesser curvature curves. It's typically and commonly associated with a parasophageal hernia. And it can be evidence of ischemia, though the ischemic changes are usually late. The classic findings, of course, gastric outlet obstruction with 180 degrees or more rotation. And clinical management, of course, is going to be surgical. In the case I showed you here, you can see that this, the body of the stomach is flipped to the right in a large hiatal hernia. Reversal of uh, the uh, greater and lesser curvature is seen. Again, very nice example on the CT study. Another case, what about this patient? Again, dysphagia, what's going on here? Well, this looks very similar to the last case. You're looking, where's the esophagus? Where's the duodenum? And what you really have here is a volvulus, but in this case is in the uh, mesenteroaxial perspective. You see rotation around the short axis of the stomach. It's less common than the organoaxial volvulus. And in fact, you can have both of them sort of combined. Uh, you see the antrum superior to the GE junction. Again, rotation in this case is usually under 180 degrees. It's not associated with diaphragmatic defect.
and you can see evidence of ischemia, but that indeed is late. As with all volvulus of the stomach, surgery is mandated. Just a very nice example. Okay, what else? Well, here's a patient with nausea and vomiting. And when you look at the images, the first thing you see is air in the wall of the stomach. Again, we think about pneumatosis. We talk about large bowel. We talk about small bowel. We always worry about ischemia, though there are many cases for pneumatosis of small and large bowel. And in this case, there's air in the gastric wall. So what are we thinking about? Does this patient have gastric emphysema, which is a surgical emergency? Or does this patient have gastric emphysema, which can be managed more conservatively? And this patient was really not symptomatic. Well, what you see here is the air. Again, we think about air fluid levels. You don't get an air fluid level inferiorly. That's why we know it's really air in the gastric wall. Causes include infection, ischemia. It can be iatrogenic, such as a uh, G2 placement, and it can be a caustic injury. Uh, the CT findings include non-dependent gas in the bowel wall, adjacent frat stranding, and evidence of ischemia. But it's really, when you think about it, the air. And it can be, kind of can be tricky at times because you think perhaps it's just air in the stomach or air is laying out with food. But here you can see the fluid uh, air level in the normal stomach. But then when you go by the red arrow, you can see the uh, air within the wall of the stomach. Uh, in terms of etiology, there are numerous etiologies. Uh, patient typically we manage with supportive care, though in some cases this patient will actually end up going to surgery. Another case. Look at this one carefully. What's going on here? When you look at the antrum of the stomach in this patient with nausea and vomiting, it almost looks like a mass with a twist. And in fact, that indeed is what it is. It's a mass with a twist. And that's a gastrogastric intussusception. Uh, it's rare. Uh, you can get polyps or other processes, other tumors that can cause gastric intussusceptions. Classic findings, get, patient presents with gastric outlet obstruction. You may visualize the intussusception and see the causative mass. Surgery, again, is the study of choice, resection, or reduction. Um, in the case I showed you here, this patient had nausea and vomiting, and we saw an intussusceptum extending into the antrum with obstruction of the fundus period. At surgery, this intussusception was due to a large hyperplastic polyp. So again, common things become common, though it is pretty rare to see a gastric intussusception, particularly by a polypoid mass. The truth is, I've only seen a couple cases. This is one of them of a gastric uh, intussusception, and in this case, gastrogastric. Okay, what else? Another example. What about this case? Patient had acute abdominal pain following MVA. Now, you could look at this and say the stomach's abnormal, assuming the stomach is well distended. Could this be a tumor? Perhaps we pick up an incidental uh, carcinoma of the stomach. Well, in fact, was this was a new finding. It's a tough case, but this was an intramural hematoma. You can see the stomach involved in trauma, uh, including blunt trauma, though other organs are commonly involved. You see focal stranding, wall thickening. Gastric rupture is exceedingly rare. For penetrating injuries, you can see what you would expect to see, pneumoperitoneum, hemorrhage, and regional organ injury. And again, in these cases, surgical management is usually what's necessary. If the patient has active bleeding, then embolization can be done. Another case, patient with severe halitosis. What you see in this case is something I mentioned before about the importance when you're worrying about a fistula of giving positive contrast. Because of the halitosis, there was a question of a fistula to adjacent organ. And so you can see here very nicely a fistula between the stomach and the colon, a so-called gastrocolic fistula. Patient presents with a range of symptoms from abdominal pain to fecal and vomiting to halitosis to undigested food in the stool. There are multiple causes with penetrating gastric ulcers being the most common. It also can be due to inflammatory disease in the patient's colon or even neoplastic processes. So it's more common due to a primary colon process than a primary gastric process. Again, local inflammation, fat stranding, and visualization of the fistulae are all things that you might uh, see. Again, these patients will benefit from surgery. Okay, another patient. 
nausea following prednisone for sciatica. So drug-related processes are something you always think about. When you start a new drug, you always want to be careful about potential side effects. And in this case, the patient actually has diffuse thickening by the greater curvature. There's some lobulations and enhancement. And this was chemical gastritis. And this is most commonly due to NSAIDs, but it can be due to corticosteroid or antibiotic use. On a CT appearance uh, basis, as you can see here, focal wall thickening, localized stranding, perforated ulcers are all indeed very common. Uh, because of the patient's presentation, which is often severe, the patients will get endoscopy. Usually with chemical gastritis, there's marked inflammation, and it won't be that difficult to diagnose this. But if not, it can be confusing for malignancy. And again, um, key things in terms of management will be to put the patient in NPO and make sure whatever the uh, causative agent is, is stopped, for example. Okay, another case. Patient with cirrhosis, presenting with dizziness and anemia. When you look at the images, the stomach is well distended, but there's high density material in the stomach, and that's consistent with a bleed. Now, the mortality for upper GI bleed is under 10%. There are a number of different reasons. The most classic is an ulcer. Variceal bleeding, Mallory Weiss, vascular lesions and neoplasms, all are possibilities. With active GI bleeding, you may see contrast extravasation. Um, you may see, as in this case, an intramural hematoma. Clinical diagnosis is usually made via endoscopy, but it can be difficult, particularly a case like this where there's food in the stomach. Uh, it can be a real challenge for the endoscopist. Now, the reason you might take these patients to endoscopy would be to stop the bleeding. If you want to stop the bleeding, you can also go to surgery, of course, but again, managing the patient becomes very critical. Now, another case, another example. You have to think out of the box on these cases. This is a patient, or in fact, two separate patients with anxiety disorders. Well, what you can see here is these things do not look like polyps. These things do not look like tumors. They're higher density. It's not contrast because they both look like foreign bodies, and that indeed is what these were. This patient ingested the foreign body. The image with the longer process, the patient had a toothbrush within the stomach lumen. And the lower image, the patient had a Christmas light within the stomach. So foreign body ingestions are common in children, the mentally ill, and those who are limited intellectually with disability. Uh, they can result in perforation uh, from a CT perspective you will often see the foreign body itself. Local inflammation, obstruction, and perforation are all dependent on the size of the foreign body and where the foreign body locates. Clinical management, if possible, endoscopy works well. Though of course, it's often a challenge if you have things like razor blades where it can be very problematic removing the, the uh, final foreign body. So it can be very challenging. Sometimes we've seen cases where the patients have swallowed bobby pins and the patients have swallowed so many pins that the only way of removing it is to do a laparoscopic procedure and open the stomach and remove the multiple pins. So I've covered a number of different things with you today. Uh, several points to remember to focus on. Protocol is critical to be able to make the diagnosis. If not, you're going to undercall or overcall disease. It's very easy to overlook gastric pathology because we often don't think about gastric pathology in the acute abdomen setting. Things you look for that tend to focus or favor neoplasm, focal thickening, enhancement, and over one centimeter thick. There can be not insignificant overlap between inflammatory and neoplastic processes, and it indeed can be somewhat of a challenge. In certain select cases, volvulus, gastric pneumatosis, foreign body or perforation, urgent surgical referral is indeed necessary. And with that, I gave you some references, and we'll stop and have a great day. Thanks a lot. Bye.